Welcome to the Orion X Download. This is a podcast where we discuss big ideas and big trends in high technology. Hello, Dan Olds here with another Orion X Download podcast. I want to welcome my co-host Shaheen Khan. How you doing, Shaheen? Excellent, Dan. We have another favorite topic today to discuss. We do. We're going to give everyone a sneak peek into some results from our Orion X artificial intelligence, machine learning, and deep learning customer survey. A lot and as of I like data. to say, epic, epic, epic. survey. Yes, I, an epic I, I survey. I keep finding myself using that adjective. It's a huge survey. It's the most comprehensive that I've seen out there. Uh, we have a huge number of data points. We went deep and broad on this. Now, one of the things that I want to mention to everyone out there is that... Um, we do have an audio version of this podcast, but there's also a video version that's going to have the slides. And I would say for this one, you're probably going to want to see the slides. I would say that it will be very useful. So that's going to be on YouTube. If you go to orionx.net slash AI or orionx.net slash podcast, you're going to see uh, a lot of this information there. Yeah, we will have the links there to the YouTube and to the audio version. So let's jump in. Let's, uh, let's, let's delve jump into in. it. Sure. Well, let's talk a little bit about the logistics. Uh, we did the survey over Q2 and Q3 of 2017. We really looked for respondents that are already involved and have some expertise in these projects. Um, total number of respondents are 308 individuals in 308 different organizations. Uh, we ran some numbers. We have a confidence interval of 95% on the results with a margin of error of 5.58%. And this really is comprehensive. There are more than 140 individual data points coming off of this survey. Yeah, I also want to add that we kept running the survey until the data basically stopped changing. Yes. Uh, So the results between the total at the end and where it was about 50 responses earlier were were, were pretty similar. And that, that, that gave us some confidence that the result is converging. Let's take a little look at the uh, respondents and their organizations. Uh, as you can see on the on the slides, uh, we have a very good representation, everything from financial services and insurance, which was the largest respondent set, uh, including also manufacturing, engineering of consumer products, manufacturing, engineering of business to business products. That's the second and third largest um, also a little bit of government research, some academic and nonprofit, uh, medical health care, all down the line. It's a pretty good representation of, of who's doing what in AI, uh, ML, and DL. Uh, also a fairly good spread of organizations, um, preponderantly uh, small organizations, one to 49 employees, but that's sort of how the economy is. You have a lot of small organizations, but we did have a nice chunk of larger companies uh, with uh, more than a thousand employees, including some with more than a hundred thousand. Yeah, I'd say we got probably on the order of 25, 30% smaller companies, but that also represents the whole state of AI as well. Yes. Is that there are lots of uh, smaller organizations uh, that, are, that, are, that are working on this. Yes. Taking a look at their role in the organization, uh, this is something we do a little bit differently. A lot of surveys will ask for a uh, job title, and uh, at least in my mind, that doesn't tell me very much. You know, a VP in a small uh, company will have a lot more power than, say, a VP in a bank, because everybody's a VP in a bank. So what we ask about is what sort of, of knowledge do you have of the organization? What's your role in the organization? Do you have detailed knowledge on platforms and applications? Are you, for instance, a key recommender for app software? Or do you actually make decisions on software? Or do you make platform decisions? It's those kinds of things that we're showing in this chart here. And as you can see, um, about 80%, well, only 20% say they're mostly a user. And by the way, we're still interested in the user opinions because they do mold these decisions. Um, But uh, close to 80% are absolutely part of the IT process. 
go a little bit deeper with the respondents. Uh, current involvement with with AI, uh, by far the vast majority of these folks are either in AI substantially or full time, or at least keeping up with the field. A little over 40 percent are substantially and full time involved. Um, uh, some partially involved, but again, the vast majority of people that responded to the survey are involved with AI, ML, or DL. I mean, in general, we're trying to uh, reach folks who know what they're talking about when it comes to AI, and yeah. they have active involvement or recent active involvement. Some of them are management, so they are quite adept at things, but they may not be doing hands-on every day. Uh, so those would be uh, partially involved. Those uh, There are people who have been really deep into it uh, and are just looking at a different aspect of it. So all of those are involved in these things. Mm -hmm. And taking a look, uh, it's kind of an interesting question to the right, uh, their understanding of AI, allowing them to self-rate themselves. And it's interesting that uh, most, most of the respondents rate themselves a three or lower by a fairly wide margin. Yeah, well, the bulk of them are three and four, but it is interesting that as good as all of these people are, based on previous questions, that they their self-ranking says that they could know more. I think that's indicative of how early in the evolution yes. of this area there is, that you know, even if you are a professor of AI somewhere, you're looking at one aspect of it and not like some of the other aspects. So there are very few people who feel they have an overall 360 view of AI that they would rank themselves as a five, right? Uh, yeah, exactly. And we had about 7% say that they felt they had that sort of expertise. Yeah, and then you got another 60, 70% who are three or four, and then a few others uh, on the order of, let's say, 30% who think that they could benefit more from, uh, from, from exposure or deeper understanding. And we're going to see... Uh, a little bit more of that, of uh, yeah. a little bit more exploration into that yeah. topic in some succeeding slides. Uh, let's talk about uh, next slide how they regard um, uh, AI. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, one of the one of the things that's going on in this uh, world is just a taxonomy of AI. Is it artificial intelligence? Is it machine learning? Is it art deep learning? Uh, there are folks who believe uh, those are very different things, and they're very careful how they ascribe that sort of nomenclature. There are others who think, nah, they're all the same, and it really depends on where you're coming at it. At the same time, while machine learning AI DL is all happening, we've had a long history in enterprise of data warehousing, business intelligence, analytics, on to going to big data and streaming, and all of that is in the, is in the mix as well. So we just wanted to see how, what, what label people use on their technology and their projects. And, and generally, the, the response is that machine learning is a little bit ahead in terms of uh, what label they use. It's basically either artificial intelligence or machine learning, and deep learning being a little bit of a distant, distant third. Uh, also, uh, that you know, about 60% recognize that these terms refer to very different things. But for something like 40%, they think it's all the same bucket, and let's not be splitting hairs. Yeah. So the one that really interested me is um, how they differentiate between uh, data warehousing, BI, and big and uh, big data as it relates to AI. And the majority believe that uh, data warehousing, BI, big data are milestones in their path towards AI or subsets of AI, which I strongly agree with, and that's what I saw throughout the survey. That's right, that's right. There's definitely a data uh, supply chain, if you will. There's a flow of data that starts from where it gets incepted and then it goes through all of these treatments until you kind of graduate to, okay, I can do AI on this now. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, going a little farther now, uh, we're taking a look. We, we did do several questions on budgets, and we're presenting a few of them here. Uh, this is future AI budgets for hardware, and we're seeing that the growth in hardware spending slightly favors, favors cloud, but it is pretty close to parity, on-premises versus cloud. It really is. You know, there's really uh, no, no statistical change, essentially, between on-premises and cloud, but Based on other questions that we've asked, we think that cloud gets the edge slightly. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, that may just be the, uh, the, the the phase that people are in, uh, but it also shows that uh, you know cloud cloud is not really the panacea for everybody. Yeah, and even panaceas aren't what they used to be. No, not anymore. That's right. That's right. <laughs> oh, one of the now, things wh- that we didn't include here is we also asked. Um, if they had any preference towards cloud versus on-prem for training, uh, for, I believe, dev- development and also production. And there, right. there was a, a little bit more of a skew towards cloud for training, but a little bit less when they got to production. Right. I think then they want to f- enforce SLAs and uh, fast response times. And yeah. I know the cloud people are working very hard to... Uh, deliver that kind of uh, tight, tight, tight response times and service levels. But really, the gap. Uh, if we, you know, if you move on, the gap, the big gap, really, yes. the largest spending growth is to address skill shortage. Yes, absolutely. Uh, everybody seems to agree that it's just hard to find people who know AI. There's hard to find people who know the specific package that you're using or the specific model, and uh, therefore, a lot of money is going towards education, training, staffing, recruitment. And of course, if you move on further, that also benefits the service provide uh, uh, professional services and consultants who have that skill set and can fill the gap immediately. Yes, and that's something we saw on some other slides as well. So moving on, um, kind of interesting here. What department is driving AI in these various respondents? Engineering was number one. I would have thought we'd see more marketing, sales, and advertising. Yeah, and I think the reason is because they're building product. Mm -hmm. They're trying to incorporate AI into their product, uh, and that means engineering is involved in a big way. Um, And of course, right behind it was uh, customer service and maintenance, and of course, that's also if you want to do predictive maintenance or if you want to do... Uh, you know, remote maintenance in a, in a good way or recognizing what escalations you should look at and whatnot, all of that could benefit from AI. You know, and those dovetail really well with the next uh, chart, which is the benefits that they expect to receive. What they're going for here is business innovation and competitive advantage. That's about 45%. Uh, also, number two there, with almost 30%, is cost reduction, which I think gets directly at that customer service and maintenance. Right on, right on, right on. Uh, AI is also, you know, kind of split between whether it's a special team or whether it's the main IT. And this is very reminiscent of what we used to see with people installing ERP or making a move towards big data later on. Yeah. And even way back to like the dot-com era, when you, Mm -hmm. when dot-com came in and it became a business imperative, uh, we want, you know, fundamentally the reason we asked this question was to see what the buying behavior is. Do they... Do they do, do, do customers channel AI purchases through traditional IT organizations, or do they form a tiger team on the side that has authority to move fast and not have to be subject to the traditional chip, checks and balances of IT? And and what we see here is that uh, you know better than half of the cases it's the traditional IT, mm-hmm. uh, and and that's interesting. But you know we've seen that since dot com era where. If the company needs to do something really fast, they just create a side uh, organization to go do that. So if you're a vendor trying to sell to a customer, well, that's really an important thing to know. Mm, Exactly. Uh, Driving on, we asked about uh, uh, their specific AI problems. Most of them are saying that it's big data analytics and it's a mix of search and computation, followed closely by big data search and complex queries. And so oh, yeah. we're doing, you know, we're doing basic, I, I don't want to say basic business processing, but but it's um, crunching data that they already have, and it's still very closely related to um, big data yeah. analytics. Yeah, very, very clearly, it looks like some of this comes about because you have a mass of data you already have, and you're trying to extract more value from it. But once yeah, you get started yeah. on that, you say, ah, I have the opportunity to add this data and that data, and then you go into a main data acquisition uh, framework. And I would say that, that what I was trying to get out in my mumbly, stuttery way was that this is really the evolution of big data analytics, I believe, as opposed to a revolution. 
I, I think so. I think when you when you when you when you kind of uh, uh, soften the edges, the core is exactly what you said. Mm. Uh, average size, these projects are pretty big, 550 terabytes for the largest project within these respondents. Total uh, project size of all of their projects is about 610. So really what we're talking about is folks that are doing one very large project in most cases. And taking a look at where they are, uh, the bottom left, supervised versus unsupervised. Uh, they're doing both, but primarily supervised learning. And phases for their project, it's still early. Uh, right. less, less than 7% are actually ruled out to production. Yeah, that's a pretty small percentage and shows that the vast majority are still building it, not deploying it. Yeah. Or if they are deploying it, it's in a very limited deployment point. Yeah, and that, that yeah. makes sense to us. Yeah. You know, the other thing the storage data indicates is that uh, people use most of the data they have access to mm -hmm. uh, for these projects. Mm -hmm. Diving down a little bit deeper, we asked about uh, we asked question a question about how familiar folks are uh, with pretty much every AI framework out there. I right. know you, I think you beat the <laughs> bushes to find every single one. I know. There are probably a couple that have been announced since this survey was done <laughs> just like a month ago, because that's just how fertile the ground is. Uh, but this is, you know, certainly about two dozen different frameworks that we asked folks to rank in terms of whether they're planning to use it, whether they have in fact used it, or whether they are they have expertise in it. Mm -hmm. And the answer is that it's still an open field. It's really all over the map. Some of the better known ones. Have are a lot better of known. <laughs> are better known, right? Right. TensorFlow is well known. Yes. You know, Cafe is well known. Scikit is well known. IBM Watson is well known. Uh, you know, Spark's machine uh, uh, learning library is pretty good. Keras is pretty well known. But uh, but it's not like the rest are unknown. Uh, yes. You know, they're, they're, you know the, the the lowest score we got was about eight uh, percent. Um, and 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 the vast majority are between twenty percent and forty percent. Yes. And so it is a wide open field. Totally. And of course, it's a wide open also when you get to hardware. Exactly. Uh, you know, we, we, we ask what, what hardware you use in terms of both vendors and they're all over the place. Uh, and then we ask which specific hardware accelerator are you familiar with or are you using? And there are like 20 different hardware accelerators that people have on their radar. Yeah, and, figure that. Uh, I and again, you know, every one of them has better than 25% ranking here. I was shocked at that. Right. So, uh, the message is don't just look at the famous guys. Yeah. Uh, do a little bit of exploration because and and again, I bet, I, I think a couple of new chips have been announced since like last month. Uh, so we're not done yet in no. terms of uh, the 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 area be getting a little bit narrowed down. And some of these are highly specialized and might be a great fit for a particular project, but not so much for others. So there's a lot of corners, I think, being attacked in these with these chips. Yeah, some, you know, some of these AI deployments have a bit of an embedded quality to them because it's mm -hmm. very clear what they're going to do, and they're going to do that for a very long time. Uh, so you might as well optimize the heck out of it and not worry about how general purpose your chip is because that's not, you know, it's not, a, it's going to be doing this and only this for the next like five years. So you might as yes. well. Yeah, I think that's the way to go. Let's move on with data attributes. And this is kind of surprising with all the attention that unstructured data gets. Uh, the majority of folks are using structured data. And by the way, let me let me mention one thing here that the reason these don't this pie doesn't add up to 100 is because there's a third option in there that we didn't show because it wasn't very meaningful but it was structured and unstructured data so kind of the folks with a with a split down the middle but primarily it's structured data yeah and of course uh yeah, it's all it's 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 its own podcast at some point. The transformation of unstructured data to structured data. Yeah, and whether it happens before you declare you have a database, or whether it happens after you declare you have a database, and who actually is in the business of doing that structuring? Is isn't it the there, application? Isn't there someone that comes out and says, "I now declare this data to be structured," <laughs> yeah, and a, right. cert a certificate is issued? 
the data structure fair here. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's unstructured up right. until then. But it fundamentally comes down to, is it the application developer that does it, or is it the database administrator that does it? Where in the stack does it happen? And taking a look at the source of data, uh, uh, this won't be a surprise to anybody, given what we've seen so far. A lot of it is log data and ERP data. And some customers are about 38% are buying third-party data to drive their AI projects. Yeah, definitely. What we wanted to get at was how much of the data is internally developed, how much of it is uh, acquired from outside, how much of it is public domain. And what do you do when you reduce it all into the core data that you then feed into AI? Yes, yes. And look at the data types. Uh, we've heard so many examples out there of people using it for images, for text recognition, things like that. But by and large, the what people are doing today is text and numbers. So text searching, uh, text correlation, and numbers. Yeah, that of course, you know, once you think about it, it makes quite a lot of sense that yes. while there's a lot of effort in, at the research level with image and video and audio and such. Which is what's uh, getting the publicity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it, but it also means that the, the data that people have available is mostly text and numbers. And yes. especially if you consider that something like 60% of the data is log data or sensor data, all of that is text and numbers. Yeah, same with the business data. From ERP. Yeah, that's true. That's true. That's true. It's, you know, pricing, addresses, customer names, etc. Sure. Yeah. And correlating that to other things. So then we looked at app development. Yeah, this was which really is interesting a big too. Part of this. Yeah. Yeah, and I want to direct us, you, me, and the <laughs> audience, us. I want to direct you to the uh, one on the right, the graph on the right, the bottom asking customers if they would use a turnkey solution if it were available. Only 27% or so said they would, which means that, you know, 25, 27%, that means that 73% uh, uh, want something custom to their organization. Yeah, that, I mean, the message was that even if turnkey solutions were available, uh, the vast majority would be doing some level of custom work in addition to just setting parameters in the package that they just bought. That doesn't count as no, customization no, in this question. Custom. We're talking about actual development. Yes. And uh, they expect to have to get some help from outside to do it. Yeah, Only but generally 33% the walk away. said that they could do it fully in-house. Right. The generally the walk away is that it's mostly in-house, it's mostly custom. Yes. And to me, I think that they're on the right track with this. I don't think there, there's going to be a lot of folks offering turnkey solutions, but those solutions are not going to fit for something like, a, uh, like AI. Right, right. But, you know, that also says that if you're a software vendor trying to cater to this market, maybe you want to make sure that you have more of a tool set or a library or exactly. That's something a great that point. is extremely customizable rather than... A, 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 you know, a full-on application that can be tweaked here and there. Don't try and build their stack for them, in other words. Right, right. Yeah, that's that's a great point. Uh, driving on the top challenges, and that all has to do with data, uh, both getting the necessary volume of data and then gathering relevant data and validated data. Those are the two big winners here. That's the big, those are the biggest challenges, but followed pretty closely behind by the ability to hire skilled personnel and the skill sets they have in the org. Really, it comes down to data and skills. Those are the top challenges. Yes. Uh, all various aspects of data from correctness to completeness to you know, reproducibility to relevance, all of that. Uh, and of course, on the skills we've seen before in the other slide where it's just hard to find people who know what they're doing here. And for a while at least, I believe skills are going to be the, the tougher problem to, to solve. You know, given all the innovation that's going on on the hardware and software front, I would say so. Uh, there's just a lot for folks to keep track of and, and stay, stay on top of. Yeah. Uh, let's dive into the hardware a little bit more, cluster configurations. Um, it's a little bit demographical again, but the folks that took this survey have some pretty big clusters out there. 
They do. Uh, I think the, 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 the biggest number of nodes in a cluster that was reported was well over 2048. Yes. Uh, the, the vast majority, however, are really between 8 and I would say 512, which is no slouch. No. Right? No. Uh, and, if you, and if you take the number of nodes in the largest clus- cluster, because they got they got multiple clusters, and that reduces the average. If you just consider the largest cluster, then it becomes nicer. It's more like, you know, between eight and a thousand, and and those are pretty big clusters. Yeah, and, yeah, and twenty percent with five twelve to a thousand nodes, that's uh, not bad, and close to twenty percent with one hundred and twenty eight to five twelve nodes. Yeah, that's, that's very true. So that's, that's very you know about forty percent of the survey. And we saw from the other question that the problems are larger and getting larger. Yes. Yeah, they're large and getting larger. Uh, we also just decided to ask about interconnects, uh, wanting to see if if sort of the HPC ethos has started to drift down into what are pri- what are primarily enterprise data centers tackling AI, and not quite yet. If you look at HPC data centers, they've got InfiniBand primarily for their high performance clusters, or Intel's OPA. They're going towards the high end of the of the interconnect uh, market but uh, these folks primarily the fastest internet they can get their hands on fastest ethernet they can get their hands on yeah it was nice to see some InfiniBand and some uh, OmniPath uh, showing up and that shows that for some workloads latency is starting to become a factor Mm -hmm. Uh, but I think uh, given that the vast majority are still building it uh, yeah, yeah. That that you know, fastest internet will, will will be more than more than fine for now. Yeah, uh, node configurations, uh, pretty high memory on these things. Not surprisingly, but uh, again, it's early, so we do see a big chunk of folks with eight to fifteen gigabytes per node on probably pretty low no count node count uh, configurations. Uh, they are also uh, configuring GPUs, uh, just a. 15% or so are really going whole hog with three or more GPUs or accelerators per node. Uh, two GPUs, a pretty popular choice, but most of them are still at one GPU per node. So then we asked a whole lot of questions about how customers go about selecting vendors, what attributes they want to see in vendors that make them compelled to go that way. And then we also asked about how they select both products and um other things that they're going to be using in their AI efforts, uh, just to get a feel for how they rank different attributes like being open source uh, versus having all of the functionality we want from the very start. But this is a really interesting chart on the left, the grasp of market offerings. And look at that split that uh, 49% believe it's not all that complicated, and 51% say, no, there's too much going on. It's hard to keep up with it all. Put me in that 51%. Yeah, I think if I think that 49% are probably the experts that are responding who are, who are able to keep track of it all. I don't know, uh, I, I, or else yeah. it's the people that haven't dove down deep enough <laughs> into this yet. <laughs> <laughs> Again, it's early, and as soon yeah. as it gets, they get deeper. I think that they're going to the, be moving over. That fifty-one percent is going to be getting bigger. They haven't looked up from their laptop. <laughs> no, no, they they need to do some uh, Google searching. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then you know, related that was a question of do you buy the product first, and then you know figure out what who the vendor is, or do you pick a vendor first because you're looking at a long-term relationship. And then you just buy into the roadmap and you stay with them. And that was interesting because uh, about seventy mm-hmm. percent said they're going to build a pro- you know, pick the product. They're going to look for the functionality, and they don't really care who the vendor is, unless the vendor gets disqualified through other other attributes that mm-hmm. we also ask. Yeah, and that tells me they see quite a bit of differentiation between what's out there and the various vendors. You're looking at hardware, software, uh, professional services. They see quite a bit of differentiation. Right. 
But, you know, we're only scratching the surface. We've shown you a handful of slides here. We also did uh, another handful of slides, some of them overlapping on Inside HPC. And uh, there's a lot more data in this survey. And if you're interested in finding out more about it, uh, please go to our website. We do have the, the uh, results up for sale for a nominal price with special academic discounts, which I think is pretty great of us, Shaheen. Oh, it is. It is quite generous, yes. Also, um, uh, follow us on Twitter at uh, OrionX underscore net. Uh, and that also includes some of this information that we've put out. Uh, but definitely uh, consider the whole set because there is just a lot of uh, data that takes a long time to really go over in a session like this. Yeah, we've gone, you know, half an hour, over half an hour on this. And again, there's just so much more data. Yeah, epic, as I said. It's an it is. epic survey. It yes. was, it is epic, still is epic. And uh, I know it about broke Excel for me a couple of times. <laughs> That's right. Anyway, well, thank you for listening. We really appreciate it. Please follow us. Uh, check out our website. Check out some more data on uh, AI, DL, and ML. And we will talk to you again on the next Orion X download.